if you're looking for a beginner tutorial, sort of kind of how-to guide for getting into stand-up paddle boarding for the first time, you found the right video and you found the right guy because, well, I could give you a quick little backstory on my background with stand-up paddle boarding in the United States. Now, years ago, around 2003, some of the first paddle boards to ever hit the US mainland came from Jimmy Lewis. They went to Real Water Sports and it all kind of happened because I was sitting there, I was a kiteboarding instructor and I was doing graphic design for Real Water Sports at the time for the website, soft goods, things like that. And in my off time, which whenever I was sitting at the computer, I'm researching other types of water sports. And in Hawaii, they had something called beach boy surfing. And beach boy surfing is what we know today as stand up paddle boarding. So I was sitting at my computer and I found this really old website of these Hawaiian dudes out in the channels paddling between the islands. So they would get on these long downwinders on 14 and 15 foot paddle boards and they'd spend all day paddling from one island to the next. Now, a lot of times they would have a follow boat or somebody going with them, but I was really interested in ocean sports. So this seemed perfect to me to be able to use a surfboard with a paddle, stand up on the surfboard full time without having to paddle into a wave laying down. It seems like I would always be up on the board in a surf position. So whether you're gonna take these out in the ocean you probably want a hard top if you're gonna do that. Hard top is just essentially like a, a epoxy composite style board. Those are most of the modern boards that are out nowadays. Or you can get the inflatable board, which is pretty much the predominant stand up paddle board you're gonna see in like Walmart, Costco, places like that. Those boards range in average from 300 to $400. You can get a fancier one, I believe like a name brand Nash board that's gonna cost you around 1600 for an inflatable. Um, so you're getting up close to the same range as you would be able to buy a hard top for. So um, in this video, I just wanna make it really clear that this board is pretty much one of the cheapest boards that has everything you need to get out there and stand up paddleboard for the first time, the very like base beginner model, around $300. It's the cheapest thing that I have found out there. So. Um, there might be some cheaper ones, but do you really want to go much cheaper than $300? Because it's all about construction and the way that the seams are put together in manufacturing. It's super important that the seams are welded properly. If you buy too cheap of a board, the manufacturing is cheaper and you're, you're going to end up with a busted blown seam. So we're going to talk about how to avoid that in this video. And mostly what I want to talk to you about is the basics and fundamentals of why would you get an inflatable over top of something, a hard top. That all depends on your situation. Are you someone who has like a Mini Cooper? Uh, you don't have surf racks on top of your car. These are nice because they are deflatable with the pump or just by doing it by hand. Roll it up, put it in a book bag that this one comes with, put it on your shoulders and put it in your car's trunk. So uh, very easy to get this one down to the river base or if you're trying to walk it over the sand dune to the ocean, these are really, really lightweight. The hard tops, not so light. We have a 14 foot carbon touring board, which costs us close to $3,000. That NSP board is really a nice board. It's one of the cheaper ones out there as far as carbon goes. But the thing is, is that it is much heavier. So if you're someone who can't carry uh, 50 pounds or more uh, under your arm for long distances, I'd probably go with an inflatable because the inflatables are like feather light they're super light easier to deal with than something like a kayak or a canoe you need to have wheelbase underneath canoes to bring them up and over a uh, sand dune or if you're going out down a trail to a riverbed so those are things to think about like transport once you buy something you've got to carry it to the water right so um, that's a that's a big concern now we're going to talk about the basics of what this board comes with in this review today and i'm going to show you in the links down below you can check out this board for around 300 dollars and some of my better choices if you want to spend say four to five to six hundred dollars there's a few better boards out there and i think the most beneficial thing about paddle boarding has to be the peace and the joy that you get just gliding through the water and that's what this video all is all about today it's just getting out there it's like meditation of surfing it really is it is something that brings like peace and tranquility and a little bit of a workout to my body uh, it is very very high up on my priority list for wellness and athletics so you don't have to be an athlete to get out on this board you just have to be able to stand up and paddle and i'm going to show you how the paddle goes 
how to hold the blade, uh, how to adjust it. They are adjustable paddle blades. And we're gonna talk about pumping it up, the various different ways you can pump it up. You do a manual pump or you can do an electric pump. So uh, quite a bit of information in this video. So if you're looking to get into paddle boarding, this is perfect. So we're gonna show you all you need to know and how to get out there safely and get back in safely. Here we go. All right, guys, so first things first here, we're gonna talk about the differences between a carbon paddle, which is the top one here on the screen, and a typical plastic and aluminum paddle. These are the ones that you'll get with these cheaper boards. This one seems to be a little bit nicer than the Nature Hike one we have. Uh, it is a little bit narrower as far as the blade goes, and that'll just give you a better paddling dynamic. It does have two channels on the very bottom of it to allow water to flow through. And when you put these paddles in the water, a lot of people get confused. I see people on lakes, rivers, and even in the ocean sometimes, beginners think that this paddle needs to be turned around this direction to be able to scoop the water. And this is not the right way to paddle. This blade actually needs to go into the water with it flipped up like this. So this tip goes in the water and does your stroke like this. And the same thing for this blade. You'll notice that this one has kind of a more aggressive angle on it and it's flipped up this direction. And what you wanna do is you wanna have the blade forward like that, scooping the water across. And it's a really nice movement. If you have it flipped around, you'll notice and try this, put it blade down like this to where it's down in the water, this direction, and it's gonna waddle as you paddle. So um, very important to hold the blade correctly and scoop the water like this rather than upside down and waddling in the water. This is what I see a ton of beginners doing. Um, for your first time out paddleboarding, that will be extremely awkward. So this one is also adjustable. And the way that these adjust to your height is very simple. All you have to do is once you put this three piece paddle together that comes with this one, there is an adjustment point at the very top and there are numbers here which are in centimeters and inches, which is nice. So me, myself, I'm around an 80 inch spread for my paddle. And so you wanna put your blade forward and make sure that your handle is facing the right way. So the handle should be facing outwards like this, and then your hand wraps around it this direction, and that makes it nice and comfy. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna put your paddle on the ground, and you're gonna go straight up with the top part and adjust it until your arm is fully extended and your hand is just kind of resting on the top, just resting, not overextended, but resting. So my perfect paddle length is about 80 inches and I'm gonna lock that in and now I'm ready to paddle. And when you do your first paddling, it's nice to have your hand over the top grip like this and about a 45 degree angle. Second hand needs to be about, I'd say about halfway down the blade in this type of position and you're gonna scoop the water as you go. So um, stroke along a little closer to the board will keep the nose straighter as you're paddling. Way out to the side is gonna be a paddle that's going to turn the nose left or right. So if you put this paddle on the left-hand side of the board it's, and you do a big wide stroke, it's gonna turn the, paddles, the paddle board's nose to the right. So uh, that's called a, just a wide paddle. We also have something called a back paddle, which is where you spin the blade around and you backstroke. And that's gonna basically, it's like reverse for paddleboarding. It puts you in reverse and it starts spinning you around in a circle. So depending on which way you wanna turn is which side of the board you put the paddle on. So closer to the board, it's gonna make um, kind of a, a smaller turn. And if you wanna turn faster, put the paddle further away from the board and you'll sort of turn a, a bigger, wider turn. So uh, a little bit to be learned there and, and just experiment with your paddle, but this is gonna become your best friend in paddle boarding. Now, most of these paddle boards do come with a standard manual pump and the pump has one valve on here. This one does not have a deflator valve. Um, sometimes they'll have a, a pump valve on the other side that you can screw this hose onto and it has a pretty standard universal type of valve. So this one goes into most of the paddle boards out there nowadays. This one even works on my $1,600 Nash one board. So it has the same exact valve system on here, uh, which is nice because this pump could be interchangeable. It also has a little dial on the, the top of the pump right here, which lets you see what PSI you're at. Um, and this board in particular, if you decide to buy the cheap $300 board, I would safely pump this one up to about 12 PSI. I wouldn't go over 12 to, I wouldn't go anywhere over 14 PSI because you're gonna to start to stress the seams. 
um, super important and the valve stem at the very back that has some glue on there and you don't want to kind of push that on a hot day it'll release and you'll have a, a popped board the next way that you can pump up your board which is the way that i prefer that i recommend uh, forget the hand pump and go with an electric pump when this one first came around i was super excited because i had originally bought a nash one and you can see this one has the same type of valve on here it has a same exact valve and this one is about five years old this is a 200 dollars pump and it has two contact like clips on here for attaching to your car battery and this was great four or five years ago but now we have something that works on a 12 volt cigarette lighter and this one is 80 bucks versus 200 and this is my second one because my original one died and i had to get a warranty through nash so they sent me a second one but this one is simple it plugs into the cigarette lighter and the cable's long enough to actually reach outside the car and be able to get to your powder board. It has enough length on here that it isn't a problem. This one's also a digital set PSI adjustment on here, positive, negative, adjusts it. You can see that on the handle right there. And it has an inflator and a deflator valve there. So you can move this hose to one side or the other. It actually says inflate, deflate on the sides. So this one also has inflate, deflate, but it has a little dial and these pumps once they get to that set psi they'll actually turn off and stop instead of keep going and blow up the board which is uh, a really nice feature it has a built-in stop mechanism that's kind of nice now a couple other things about this board is that it does have a center strap carry handle so that is right here and over here on the far side of the board is where you can put your life jacket. If you guys are out in the ocean or rivers, I always recommend that you have a life jacket on board. Some places it's actually a requirement because they do deem stand up paddle boards as a vessel and all vessels have to have a life jacket on there. So um, important actually that you, you have some type of life jacket. On our paddle today, unfortunately, we did not have life jackets, so we're not really setting a good example, I know, but also it has a nice deck pad on here. It's a two color deck pad. And it does seem to be really well fixed to the top of the board. After a few years, sometimes these deck pads will come off, but you can also get replaceable deck pads like at your local surf shop or stand-up paddleboard dealer. I like that this board has a grab handle on the very back. So if you have someone helping you up front, if they're carrying it from the front, you can hold it from the very back. And this is something that I haven't seen on other paddle boards recently. So this is a fairly new thing. And back here we have our valve. It says 15 PSI or one bar. Uh, I would recommend that you pump this up to about 12 PSI. It will still be really stiff and it'll feel almost like a hard top. It's not going to do a lot of flexing on you. So the nice thing about this board too is that it pumps up nice and hard and it doesn't do that typical uh, under deflated sort of banana effect that some of the paddle boards have. So some of them that are a little bit too long and they can't get hard enough. Uh, and this was years ago, they, they had much thinner layers. Now these are typically three to four layer construction. So, um, and with, with double welded seams, which is really, really nice. Now this valve again, is the same one we had before. You can also deflate it by pushing on this pin right here. And you'll hear that. And that lets the air out. You can also do it manually. Now it also comes with this leash and the leash is actually pretty easy to put on. There's a little ring back here. You might've been wondering what that was for. That's just for your surf leash. This is about a six foot leash. I do recommend wearing a leash though, if you're out paddling because well, if the board gets away from you and you're on a, on a river that's moving pretty fast, uh, it could be a long swim back. So you wanna make sure that you use your leash. If you're in waves, I, I sometimes typically don't wear a leash in the waves, but that's usually when I'm riding a hard top so the board doesn't fly back and hit me. So this is a typical standard surf knot and it's super easy to tie this on. You can untie the knot that was already tied in it. And to do that surf knot, all you have to do is kind of take both strands together, run it around your finger and then come back and rabbit goes back through the hole and out the other side. And the more this gets pulled on, the tighter it gets. So this is a nice sort of ocean style knot that will never come untied on you unless the cord actually breaks. So we'll, we'll slide one side through the ring and then we take both sides together, run it around your index finger and take the end pieces, the two end pieces, rabbit goes back through the hole, out the other side and we pull it tight, make a nice little ball there with your knot, pull it nice and tight. And now your leash is on and ready to go. This just simply goes around your ankle.
Okay, so now you know a little bit of difference between the different paddles that you can choose for stand-up paddle boarding. You know how to adjust your paddle to your height for paddling your stand-up paddle board, and you know the differences between the electric pump, the manual pump, uh, a more expensive pump, and uh, the, the $80 digital pump, which I prefer. I'll put a link down below for this one. You also get a repair kit in the box, which is kind of nice. Um, one of the things about the repair kit is that while it does come with some adhesive in here um, and a, a little repair tool kit here, I believe this is actually for the the uh, the stem in the very back. You need to take that stem where the valve is on and off. This is kind of a nice tool, but uh, this right here is not going to repair a seam. So if you bust it somewhere along here, it's likely that you're not gonna be able to repair that seam. Um, and, and it doesn't come with any glue in here. So you'll need to get specialized glue that you can use with this vinyl. Uh, this is just a, a piece of vinyl that comes along with the board. And, and this is primarily for repairing flat sections of the board, not the welded seam. The welded seam is a whole different deal and that requires somebody uh, that has professional tools to do that. So it might cost around $200 for that type of repair. So if your seam pops, not good. If it's just a little slice somewhere on the top deck or the bottom deck, do it yourself and repair it and it, it should last for quite some time. You just gotta get the right glue. Um, I will try to find some glue for this piece of vinyl that comes along with the board and put that link down below as well. But now you know the difference between all these different things. You know how to put the leash on and uh, you know some basics about the stand-up paddleboard sport. So let's go ahead now. Let's take this board out to the river and let's relax and let's just do a peaceful, beautiful river. I'm going to show you one of the most beautiful rivers in Oregon. It's called the Tualatin and it is extremely relaxing to paddle. Sunset paddles are like <laughs> the most enjoyable paddles of the entire day. Early morning or sunset paddle, that's the time to go. The water is glassed out and it's absolutely, absolutely stunning. Just so beautiful, so relaxing. Let's do some paddling together. Here we go, guys. Okay, guys, it's time to choose your location and choosing a location is pretty important. You want to find a place where other people paddle or canoe or kayak and you've seen people out in that body of water before don't just choose a random river and go hop in it um, try to make sure other people are around when you do your first paddleboard session now i like to top off the paddleboard after i use the electric pump just a few more pumps and securing the fin is pretty easy it just slides in and locks into place with no tools adjusting the paddle again with your hand fully extended but relaxed on top of the handle and carrying it down to the water is pretty easy getting into the water hop in the water on the side of a bank where you have a nice sandy bank maybe a foot or two deep make sure the fin is out of the sand when you go to stand up on the board so you don't break your fin and have your feet nice and wide apart right in the middle of the board where the strap is that's the very center of the board and if you're in a headwind, you can walk forward on the pad to get a little bit better sort of uh, grip into the wind. And, and that will keep sort of your headwind in check and allow you to paddle a little bit faster instead of being kind of pushed backwards by the wind. Typically what I do is I paddle into the direction of the current. If the current is say going um, to the left, I will paddle into the current on the way out and then come back home down river. Um, so in the case of today, there's no, there's no real current going either direction. It's pretty still water today and it's all glassed off. At the end of the day, most of the time, it's a really nice glassed off condition. And once you get out here and you start paddling, you can really see some beautiful, beautiful places. It's kind of a perspective that you don't typically get when you're driving back and forth to work or even just at home. It gets you out in the environment and it really makes us feel connected with ourselves and the environment around us. And it, in a way, it's kind of fun because you're sort of exploring places where you've never been. And again, this is always a good idea to have a life jacket along with you, especially if you're not a good swimmer. And if you get tired, you can always take a seat on this paddleboard. It's nice and soft. 
and the hard tops as well. And the hard tops, typically the longer they are, this board is 14 foot, it tracks really well. That means that it goes in a straight line really nicely. Just gorgeous homes along the river. Million dollar homes nestled back in the Pacific Northwest here. Just a fantastic paddle today. And it really is like meditation. You can go as slow as you want or you can paddle as fast as you want. If you're looking for more endurance or a core workout, it really does work out your abs, your shoulders, your arms, your biceps, your quads, and it strengthens your ankles. You might notice the first time you go out and paddle that your feet start to feel sore, and that's when you can just take a seat on the board. Over time, you'll strengthen those leg muscles and you'll be able to go further without having to take a seat. And today we're just doing a short paddle, just testing out this board for you guys. And we found that it's, it's a good overall board for, I guess, uh, adults or, or children, because it is somewhere, I'd say, in the, in the middle range of the length of these paddle boards. Around 10 foot, it's about the average length. Now, when you're getting out of the water, you wanna be super careful and, and get some help from somebody. And that's a wrap for today, guys. That was a lot of fun paddling with Rebecca. She did great. She's an awesome paddler. All right, guys, welcome back from our paddle. Wasn't that peaceful? How beautiful is that scenery? And that's the biggest thing that I get as far as a takeaway from stand-up paddle boarding. Uh, it's kind of like one of those things where you're sitting around the house at the end of the day and you're like, should we go paddle boarding? You know, it's kind of like a bike ride. Should I go for that bike ride? Should I go for that run? And whenever you come back for that run or bike ride or paddling session, you always come back feeling super, super good. It just does something to your insides when you get out and you have a session on the water. Uh, water sports really change the way you feel about everything in your life. It just brings more unity and uh, love and connection with my environment to my life. And I say love because you can bring your family and your friends and your kids along with you and you can do it all together. It's like a family sport. Um, I've even had my grandmother on a paddleboard. She can do it, so you can do it too. It's, it's really not that hard. It just takes a little bit of effort of getting one, pumping it up properly and just carrying it down to the water. Start on the side of the water where it's got a little ankle deep water. Make sure your fin is uh, deep enough so that it's not dragging and get on the board first on your knees and stand directly in the center. Both feet in the prone position facing forward. Right where the strap is, is right where the center of the board is. And that's where you need to be standing. And, and, and one final note is that in our paddleboarding instructional DVD that I did say 10 years ago, maybe over 10 years ago now, we talked about different gears on a paddleboard. Paddleboards have sort of uh, different gear ratios that you can be in just by adjusting where your body's standing on the board. So what I call the neutral gear, um, sort of the first gear would be standing right in the dead center of the paddleboard right here and get your feet out wide as you can on the board. The wider, the better. When you have your legs narrower, they you have less balance and you're, you're, you're wobbling the board more. Spread out your feet nice and wide, wide stance. Second gear is actually when you take one step forward. And the reason you would walk to the front of the mat all the way up, this is what I call sixth gear, um, like sports cars. And it brings all your weight forward and keeps the nose down and keeps you on a nice straight track. And the reason that we walk forward on the board depends on if you have a headwind. If you have a really, say like a, a 25 mile an hour wind and you're paddling straight into that wind, it's typically not a good paddleboard day, but sometimes the wind comes up and you're going back to your home point and you get stuck in that wind going back home. Um, so uh, typically the way I do a paddle is I start out by paddling into the wind to go out um, and then I paddle with the wind to my back coming home. That's, that's really what you should do. And the same thing for rivers. Paddle up into the current first and then come with the current back home. Um, so that makes your paddle back home when you have less energy after you paddle just a little bit easier and you're not fighting to get back to your car. So um, hopefully these tips helped you and inspired you to get out on the water and do some paddle boarding. I think it will be so good for 
your soul and your your well-being for just being connected to your environment and uh, uh, feeling at peace. It really is like another form of, of meditation, it really is. So um, hopefully you enjoyed this video. You can check out the links down below. I'll put my top five best budget, cheap paddleboard, inflatable paddleboards down below. And uh, if you do grab one out of there and those links, that benefits my family. So uh, thanks again for watching. Hopefully you, you did, again, learn something in this video and be sure to comment on this video and subscribe and send us an email from dronecamps.com and you can be entered in to win our 4k drone giveaway this month so i'm um, giving back to the subscribers on my channel i uh, really appreciate it we'll see more drone videos coming up and camping videos so drone camps the best of both worlds right here on the channel guys i'm justin davis take care and i'll see you on the next one